All right, so as that's happening, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're in this series called Viral, this idea of what it looks like for a message to become a movement. Um, that early in the church, we see this happen. Uh, with, with the early disciples, the early followers of Jesus, uh, there was this expectation that because they had been impacted and influenced and that their life had changed, then they would spread the word. They would tell others about Jesus. Uh, really, it was kind of this idea of going viral before we had the language of something going viral. Uh, we've seen a few videos over the last few weeks, this idea of one person posting something and how it quickly gets shared and it goes quickly to one person to another and where millions, literally millions to billions of people see something because one person enjoys it, likes it, and they share it. And so we've looked at videos and, and there's been a couple of things that have gone viral that have been really interesting to me. And the interesting part of it is because there's been really some disagreement to it. So not video today, but pictures. So here's the first picture. Some of you are going to know what this is. Uh, oh, that again? Yes, the dress. The dress. As it, on Wikipedia, it is the dress, all right? And so uh, black and blue. Anybody black and blue? No. Okay, so what color do you see? White and gold? How many see white and gold? Wow. Wow. Wow, I thought I knew you guys. Um, so, and then, so there's this one. And so it gets posted and people are like, what color do you see? And there's this disagreement because it's just not real clear, right? People see things differently, right? You see it differently. And then there's the shoe. I don't know if you've seen this one, right? I, I'm hopeful now. Uh, teal and gray. Okay. I don't even know what the other color is, but um, pink and white. If you see pink and white. Yeah. Okay. So uh, pink and white, teal and gray. But, but here's the deal. We all are looking at the same picture. We're looking at the same picture, but we see it differently. It's not really clear. And as, as we're talking about this message becoming a movement, that the big word for that is evangelism, right? That's the, that's the, the churchy word is to evangelize. Um, it's this idea of spreading the message of letting other people know about the hope that we have experienced. And the interesting thing is, as we read the scriptures, it is very clear. It is very clear the expectation that God has for the followers of Jesus. It's clear. Uh, what's not necessarily always clear is how to do it. Right? It's clear. We talked about this. There was no plan B. Uh, Jesus gives the instruction. Look, disciples... Uh, you're going to go. Let's look in, in Acts uh, 1.8. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses or you will give testimony or testify or you will tell the story in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He says, you guys are going to take this to everyone. It is going to go viral through your mouth and through your story. There was an expectation that that would happen. No plan B. Jesus didn't say, and if that doesn't work, then here's another plan. This was the thought. That our lives, if you're a follower of Jesus, I know not everyone here would, would put themselves in that category, uh, but, but you today are going to hear the message of Jesus because these early people who followed Jesus took it seriously. And they told people, and those people told people, and it spread around the world. So it is clear the, the, what we're supposed to do in the sense of we're supposed to spread the message. But how we're supposed to do it, that often isn't always really clear. Now, as we think about spreading it, we've talked about this, there's a lot of pushback on ourselves, I think. Right? The fear of what could happen, of, of coming across judgmental or imposing our ideas, the, the fear of being shut down as we try and speak to people about the hope that we have. And so Oftentimes we've seen it done poorly, and so we think, well, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything. Maybe they'll just see the way that I live, and we've talked about that, and that is great that we live differently. But, but there's this idea of speaking it. And so we, we talked about this. The, the first week we looked at idea, the idea of prayer. Let's just start by praying. Right? Let's not get too quick into what to say or who to say it to, but let's just begin by praying. Praying uh, that, that God would show us. And so we looked at this scripture about the harvest Jesus says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are a lot of people who want to know about Jesus. You may think there's not. We looked at statistics week one and said, look, there are people who really want to know about Jesus. 
There just isn't always people to, to tell them. So he says this, ask the Lord of the harvest. Pray to God for the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. We just begin to pray, God, would you send me? Would you help me to see people differently? Would you help me to begin to communicate pe with people about the hope that I have? And then we said, look, before we even say anything, let's understand the posture that we take and the importance of the posture, right? And, and as we read, it said, you're going to do this with gentleness and respect, N not debating, not beating people up with what we believe, but with gentleness and respect, we will speak. Right? It says to always be prepared for the hope that you have. But when you do, and people ask, you do it with gentleness and respect. And then last week we said, okay, so we're going to pray and we have this posture, but then what, what are we proclaiming or what are we preaching or what are we telling people? Right? And, and we said, I said, uh, there is this thought that, man, if I just live my life differently, then people are going to know. I don't think that's always true, right? We, we looked in Romans 10 that, that when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But then Paul says this, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Not like I am now, but just proclaiming or telling. And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Someone, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus... If you would put the label of Christian on yourself, someone at some point told you. Someone. Uh, maybe it was God intervened miraculously and, and you heard something from him. That happens. It happens with my grandpa. But for the most part, most of us heard because of the beautiful feet of someone who told us about Jesus. Right? And so we understand that we pray and we take this posture of gentleness and respect. But then we speak. We, we proclaim what we believe. Not, not shouting from the corner or holding signs that hurt people or even this expectation that maybe you would do this, but the expectation of a random stranger. Uh, there's a lot of things that we have to begin to work through as we think about who we tell what we believe. So we know we need to tell, but who do we begin to tell? We see in the scriptures, and we're going to look at a few stories in a moment, that people usually came to know Jesus through relationships. They began to follow Jesus because they were connected with someone else who was following Jesus. The impact came through relationships. Uh, I, I grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, I didn't go to school at the University of Oklahoma, but I'm a huge University of Oklahoma fan. Uh, congrats, Missouri fans. You had to finally beat a big, uh, big team, and that was good for you, uh, for you guys. Um, and so uh, I'm a big OU fan. My dad flew an OU flag at our house. Uh, and so early on, uh, my kids, I just, they didn't have a choice, right? Uh, here's my son and my daughter. You can't see it real clearly. My daughter has a pink University of Oklahoma jersey on, and that's my boy, and he's got an OU onesie on, and then Kate got a little older, and um, yeah, oh, take me back to those days. Um, but o OU is something that they, uh, they think, right? that they think they care about, simply because I do. And my influence has, has spread to them because I'm their dad. And it's through relationship that, that what I believe and care about, they begin to believe and care about simply through relationships. And so we see this happen in the scriptures. Our faith, the faith of those early Christians, had the potential to spread through relationships, the people that they were the closest to. Two. Now, I want to give you a couple reasons why I think this happens, and then we're going to look at Scripture. Uh, there's four things that, that I think helps us as we think about relationships. One is you have some credibility with people. You have credibility with people. There was a book that came out years ago called Unchristian, and they were looking at some data at, about how people view Christians. And if this surprises you, um, I'm sorry, but, but people don't always have the best views of Christians um, as a whole. But it's different as they think about Christians as individuals. I think they think one way about Christianity, and they may, may put labels on people who are Christians, but, but they speak differently about people that they know who confess to follow Jesus. Oh, yeah, I, I know that person. They, they love people differently. And, and so as we think about this, they, they may have a view of Christianity, but they might look at it differently if they're in contact with you. You have a credibility that is different because you're in relationship. You can be trusted and believed in. 
And then you have visibility. Uh, your, foot, your faith is being put on display, not, not just with your words, but also with action. So as you think about in the scriptures, it talks about the fruit of the spirit. There's something that is produced in your life because you follow Jesus, a peace and a patience and a love. There's something, if you follow Jesus, that should be produced. And people begin to see that there's a visibility to your faith. And so how we speak and the way we live have to align with what we say we believe. Ultimately, they have to align with the ways of Jesus. And when they do that, we have this visibility with people. And then there's this accessibility. You have an accessibility with people that I don't. Uh, You have uh, relationships with people that the person sitting next to you may not have. Maybe it's because of your pasts and your story and your experiences. Like we talked about that last week and we talked about the moments of your life become your message that they aren't always just mistakes and they're not always just accidents, but some of those things really become the the message that you're being able to share with other people. Those moments become your message. And so you have an opportunity to go into places that I could probably never go into, right? I I often uh, hold back from telling people that I'm a pastor, right? Uh, People treat me differently when they find out I'm a pastor. Right? And so you have some spaces and places that you can go with your message that I can't. You, you have an accessibility with the relationships uh, around you. And there is this open door that often happens where, where they'll say things to you. They'll tell you about what they're worried about or their fears or, or maybe they'll even open up about addictions or brokenness in their family. Maybe they'll share about this grief that they're experiencing. They'll open up with spiritual conversations. That happens through relationships, right? The fears we think about evangelism is I have to go up to the person at the restaurant that I don't know, and I have to begin to tell them about Jesus. And maybe that happens for you, but, but the way we see it in the scriptures happens through relationships. And that's because there's this credibility and a visibility, and you have accessibility to people, And then the fourth thing, as you think about relationships, you have conversations, right? You actually talk to people. You have discussions and not debates. People hopefully hear how you care about them. And so as we think about this and we think about relationships and the the credibility that you have and the visibility, the accessibility and the conversations, those are all opportunities. And I've said this over and over, and it's really important that you hear me say this today as we go forward. The relationships that you build specifically with people who maybe don't follow Jesus or believe like you, those relationships are not projects. That is really important that you hear me say today. I'm not telling you to go find someone who is far from Jesus and make them your project. The hope is that you're in relationships with people and you love them, and the hope is that they would come to know who Jesus is. But the whole idea of having that relationship is not simply to evangelize or have this message uh, move through them. Like that would be great if that happens, but you cannot see people as projects. They're not people to be fixed, but they're just relationships that naturally open doors for you and for me to share our faith. So two quick things as I begin to share uh, what, what I think God wants to do with us, uh, but I want you to remember these things, and this will help you hopefully. It has helped me tremendously over the years, and that is number one, God is the one who saves people, Uh, not you, Uh, not me. Your responsibility is not to save anybody. Uh, There was a group of people, as Paul begins to preach and teach, there's these people who are saying, well, I want to follow Paul, and I want to follow this other guy. And so listen to this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8. It says this, I planted the seed. This is Paul talking. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. You play a role in this movement of God's story. You play a role in that, and an important role, but it is God who changes people's hearts, not you. It's not me that changes people or fixed people. I love this idea of planting seeds. I got this random box from my dad this week and I opened it up and it was full of huge acorns. So I called my dad. 
I'm like, uh, thanks for the acorns. He's like, I thought you could plant them. Okay, we had talked about we don't have oak trees in our backyard. He said, I thought you could plant them. And so Kate gets all excited and he's like, oh man, we're, we'll have acorns. He's like, how long does it take to get acorns? And I'm like, I don't know, that's a good question. It's a long time. It's like 20 to 30 years before you get acorns. I'm like, thanks, Dad. Uh, this is going to be a difficult uh, conversation and a difficult one to get excited about. Uh, but look, I could plant an acorn. I can water it and take care of it, but I can't will it to grow. I cannot make it grow faster. And so as you begin to think about relationships, you play a role in it. And as you begin to share your faith with people and you begin to have impact and influence on people, just remember it is God that changes people's hearts, not yours. You are faithful to be obedient to what he's asking you to do. And then you trust him to do the rest. And then number two is people don't always understand what we believe. But people may just not get what you believe. And that's okay. It's okay. Listen to this. Uh, Paul also says this in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To those who don't know about Jesus, what we believe can be seen as foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Because it has changed your life and you believe it, doesn't necessarily mean those who are outside of the faith will automatically want to believe it or believe it. And that's where we're patient with people and we walk alongside of people as we communicate what we believe about Jesus. And so let's look at a couple of stories. Let's see what Jesus does as he begins his ministry and how I think it impacts us. Uh, for 30 years, we don't have much of Jesus's life. Uh, Jesus comes and he begins to think, all right, I'm going to uh, get a group of people to come along with me. Uh, Jesus wasn't doing it alone. He grabs a group of people to come along with him, and we see that happening. Uh, we'll look in John 1. Uh, this won't be on the screen. It's kind of a longer passage, and so if you don't own a Bible, I would encourage you to grab one in front of you. It's on page 1050 in that red Bible, uh, but John 1, verse 29 John 1, 29. We're going to see early on what's, what's happening in the life of Jesus. And this guy named John, who is telling part of the story. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was coming. He was telling about the one who was going to come. Jesus comes and John points him out. It says, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So he is proclaiming what he believes about Jesus. Then John gave this testimony. He proclaims about Jesus. It says, I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Those who are around, he's saying, this is the one. Not me. People have thought John was more than uh, who he said he was. He's like, no, 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 this, this really isn't about me. This is about Jesus. It says the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, his followers, those learning from him. It says when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Then the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. This is a beautiful invitation. Like there's so much in this word, just come. Jesus is saying, I know you want to know about me and who I am. I'm not even going to preach at you or tell you anything. Just come, just come and be with me. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Something happens immediately for Andrew, and his first thought is, I got to go find my brother. I got to go find my brother because I know he's looking as well. I know he is longing for something and expecting something. And so I have to go find my brother. 
Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. It says the next day, Jesus decides to leave for Galilee and finding Philip, he just finds Philip, right? And these are guys who would not have been expected to follow Jesus. They may have been C plus students at best. Uh, they were not chosen at all. Uh, actually, the reason we find them doing, and you've heard me say this before, the reason we find them fishing or doing other things is because someone along the way said, look, you're not quite good enough. Uh, go, go do your dad's business. Uh, go learn to be a carpenter or a fisherman. Great try, but you're just not able to be a rabbi or a real disciple of a rabbi. And so when Jesus comes and he says, look, come, he's given this invitation to some people who would have never been invited, never been invited. And it says the next day, Jesus just leaves for Galilee and he finds Philip and he says to him, follow me. Again, there is this invitation to something more. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him. He just finds him. He just says, I've got to find Nathaniel. And he tells him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, the one we've been waiting and expecting to come. He's here. I have found him. And what he's saying is I've experienced it for myself. You have to come and see. And Nathaniel responds, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Uh, just time out just for a second. Uh, you may not even know this, uh, but we are affiliated with the Church of the Nazarene. Um, and, and what I love to, to talk about when I think of the Church of the Nazarene, a couple of things, uh, but one of those is when, when the early people begin to think about what would this movement, our denomination, be called, uh, they wanted to be called Nazarenes for a couple of reasons. One, the early followers were also called Nazarenes, Jesus of Nazareth, the Nazarene. So they called them Nazarenes. But more importantly was this scripture right here. Because early on in the church of the Nazarene, our people, we said, we want to be about those people who are often forgot and overlooked and questioned. And so I said, those are the kind of people we're going to be. We're going to be Nazarenes, those who seek and find those who are overlooked and forgotten. And so Nathaniel says, Nazareth? N nothing good comes from that place. And in this moment, if, if you have the, the mentality, you might have wanted to argue back, right? Phil Philip easily could have begun to debate and argue with him, but he just says this, just come and see. Right, right, Nathaniel, I know you have questions. I know you don't understand. I know you're wondering what this is all about, but would you just come and see? Like Philip doesn't feel like he's got to convince him or change his mind or anything. He just says, you just come and see. I'm going to let, I'm going to let Jesus speak for himself. J just come and see and experience who God is. So we see from the very beginning, there is this invitation that Jesus gives to people. At some point, some of you receive that invitation to follow him. And those who early accept the invitation... Their next response was, well, who am I going to tell? Who am I going to invite to come and see? There is a power in an invitation. Like as a kid, I can remember when you got invited to things, it helped you kind of, or maybe in a healthy or unhealthy way, uh, figure out where you belong or you don't belong. Right? And we, we can say that that only happens with, with teenagers and young people, but we still experience that as adults. Right? There's something about being invited. We see that happening over and over with Jesus. And then the thought is, as they have been invited, as the early followers were invited, they also invited other people and just simply said, come. Just come and see what Jesus is doing. This is a simple but very powerful invitation. Nathaniel comes and he has this encounter with Jesus. Jesus knows about him and speaks about him. And Nathaniel's response is, you are the king. You are the Lord. You, you are Jesus. And so can I just tell you that, that uh, I want to create and be a part of a place where all of us feel like we can just simply say that to people? Like, just come and see. Make sure and tell them we're not perfect people. Right? That this is not a perfect church. So if you're here and you're like, man, I want to find a church, we're not a perfect church. I think we are a great church, but we are far from a perfect church. 
But I want to be the kind of place where you can say, look, I know you have wanted nothing to do with the church. You don't believe in God. Hey, just, just come and see what God is doing with a group of people. Just, just come and see. You don't have to argue. You don't have to debate. One of the easiest ways, and not that the church is what will save people, not that my speaking or a program will save people, but it's encountering Jesus in a setting like this gives people an opportunity to see who God is. And so I, I don't want to just be a friendly church. I, I don't want people to walk in and think, oh, they were friendly. They were friendly with each other. Like We, we want to be a welcoming and accepting church. A welcoming church where we say, I, I, I want to know more about you. And this takes us getting out of our comfort zones. That This causes us to invite people into relationships more than just encountering them on a Sunday morning. I have this desire that we would just be this welcoming and wanting and accepting church. You are very friendly. And I think we can be and are a welcoming church, but each one of us must pay attention to that and understand the role of hospitality. This idea that a friendly and generous reception of guests, right? That we extend this friendly and generous reception to those who walk into our space. And a lot of you do this. You serve as a greeter or in our coffee area. We would love for more of you to join that team and just tell people you're glad they're here. We all play a role in this. So I hope, and if not, please tell me. I totally mean that. Just as family and as friends, uh, if you feel like this is not a place where you could bring someone, tell me. Right? I, I want to know because this is important to me and vital to us as a church. That we don't want to just say the words, yeah, this is a place where you can come and belong before you believe if you don't really feel that. Communicate that with me and we will work on that because that is who we are going to be and maybe are becoming. So who could you tell to come and see? Who could you extend an invitation to? And then as you think, you might think, well, I don't, I don't know if I know anybody. Uh, I want to look at this specific word called oikos. Just quickly, uh, in the scriptures, there's this word oikos uh, that looks at the household, right? So if, if you read in Acts, oftentimes we're going to look at a few uh, in Acts, there's this idea of something happening within a household, and the word for that is oikos. It was a family unit, uh, immediate, it was extended, it was friends and neighbors and co-workers. It was people that were gathering together in meaningful relationships or saw one another frequently. So in the scriptures, we see Jesus encounter people, and I'm going to go quickly through these. We see Jesus encounter people, and then something happens. In Luke 8, summary, uh, Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man. He casts the demon out into a group of pigs, bad day for pig farmers, uh, into a group of pigs. Uh, they run off a cliff, and there's this interaction between the demon-possessed man and Jesus. And the demon-possessed man, who is no longer possessed, encounters Jesus, and his life is changed, and he wants to stay with Jesus. I mean, why not, right? Like, you want to be next to the one who has just really saved your life. Listen to this in Luke 8, 38. It says, the man from whom the demons had gone out of begged, didn't just ask. He begged Jesus to go with him, but Jesus sends him away. I just get this picture. His life has changed. Like, I just want to be with you. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you're not going to come with me. I'm sending you away from me. And this is what he says, return home or back to your oikos. Go back to the people that you're connected to, that you do life with. Go home, return home, and tell how much God has done for you. Don't argue. Don't present four steps. Just go tell what God, we looked at this last week. Just go tell your story of what God has done. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus says, go away from me and back into your oikos, back into your community of people. Go spread the message with those people who you have done life with. Those who knew you were demon-possessed, they knew your before life, go let them see what I have done for you. Return to your oikos. We see John 4 where Jesus has an encounter with a woman at the well who had a life where she had to go middle of the day by herself to get water. She was known in the community 
for this certain way of living life. So she would go alone and she would get water and Jesus encounters her, speaks life to her and her life is changed. Sends her home and she begins to go back into her oikos. Right, you can go and read this in John 4, it's long. You can go in and see that people begin to follow Jesus who wanted nothing to do with this lady, who knew her story, but listens to her tell about Jesus, her oikos, her household, her community. And it says that they come and find Jesus and they believe for themselves, not because of her testimony, but because they have encountered for themselves. But this happens because her life is changed and she goes back into her group of people and the message spreads. In Acts 16, 11 through 15, listen to this. It says, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman, the women who were gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household or her oikos were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This group of people are spreading the message. They grow to a, go to a group of people who are already interested in God. They were Jewish. They didn't know about Jesus. They begin to speak about this message. And then you have Lydia, a dealer of purple cloth. So she was high up. She had money. She had resources. God opens her heart. Who opens her heart? It's God who opens her heart, not the speakers. Her heart is open to the message. She responds to the message. And then it says she believes. And then her whole household believes. Her oikos believes. Jesus impacts this woman's life. And then her whole household is baptized and come to faith. Just on down from that, verse 23, it says this. After they had been severely flogged, they, they uh, heal a young girl who was possessed and was actually making money for a group of people. Uh, Paul and his people heal her, and the people don't like it. Uh, she was a, a, a source of income, and so they don't like what's happened, so they arrest them. It says, they had been severely flogged, and they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. I wish I could stop and spend more time there. But even in the midst of being arrested and flogged and in jail, they're singing and praising God. And in the midst of that, people are listening. And so suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer came, called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? His response is, someone has intervened on your behalf. Tell me about that. How do I know about this Jesus? Would you tell me? It says, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The impact is not going to just be for you, but it's going to be for your oikos. Everyone who is connected to you is going to be impact and influence because of the decision you're making. It says, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family, his oikos, were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. As we think about this message becoming a movement, it doesn't always have to happen in these huge kind of ways. You don't have to have, and it could happen, but you don't have to have these encounters with people on the street that you've never met. And God can work and he does work in that way. But the way I see it happening and the way I can see it happen for us is in our oikos, in our households, in our communities, in the people that we're connected with. So I want to just, a, a real quick visual. It's taken our, our kind of our logo for the series. 
and kind of fleshing it out. And this is gonna happen quickly. I'll post on Facebook uh, if you follow on Facebook. So if you don't get this, you can, you can look at it. But just draw a circle and put your name in the circle. And then just draw a couple lines off of that. And off of that, you're just gonna name some places that would fit into your oikos. Uh, and so let's go to the next screen. And so maybe that's your family, it's your work, uh, right? You work with people. Not everyone goes to church, but everyone belongs somewhere or is connected to someone. And so as you think about your family, maybe you have family who are followers of Jesus um, and, and there is this relationship where you have conversations and you pray for each other and you encourage one another. Uh, but then maybe you have someone, maybe you have a sister who is not a follower of Jesus. And I, and I just taken a red circle there just so I visually see who are the people that I'm connected to who are not followers of Jesus or who don't go to church. And you just begin to, this is just an oikos map. You just begin to map this out. And so then you think about work and you think about the people that you see and you think about your neighbors. Do you know your neighbors? Right, I thought about this this week as people were, were talking about certain things and uh, just with things going on in our, our world and in our country, the scripture I keep seeing people post is love your neighbor. And here's the challenge. It's hard to love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor. And so I just wonder, do, do we know our literal neighbors who live around us? Uh, and so just if you don't, uh, go say, look, I know I've lived here for 15 years and this is embarrassing, but I can't remember your name. Uh, I just want to introduce myself to you again, uh, make conversation. If you don't know your neighbors, would you just, I, I, I'm going to be held accountable to this. My wife and I just moving into a new house. I've met a couple of our neighbors. We haven't met them all, but meeting your neighbors. I cannot say I love my neighbor if I don't know my neighbors. Uh, and that's physical neighbors around you. Oh, and then others. So where are the places that you go regularly? And I would encourage you, pick a place and go there regularly. Pick a coffee shop, pick a local restaurant, go there regularly and you will begin to interact and meet the same people who go there. You, you'll get to know the people behind the counter or the, check, the people who check you out. Go to the same place regularly. And so go back to the, the one with everything, uh, please. Just begin to map this out. And here's the scary part as I began to do this for myself. If you think of the red circles being people who are not Christians, if you think about the people who are um, not involved in a local church, um, I realize there's been times in my life when I really didn't know anybody. That most of my relationships were people who were followers of Jesus. They're Christians. And I think it's important for us as we map this out, and I would encourage you to do it, map it out and just begin to say, am I in meaningful, deep relationships with people who don't know Jesus? And if nothing else, begin to use this Oikos map as a way of praying for people, just to pray for them. You know what's going on in their life and, and not just the red circles. I'm not saying that. Remember, these aren't projects, but you just begin to pray for your neighbors. You begin to pray for the people that you work with. You pray for your siblings or your parents or your kids. You just begin to pray. But by fleshing this out, I think you'll begin to see that there is an opportunity for you. That as evangelism be, kind of seems overwhelming, maybe it's not that overwhelming if we see that we're already connected with people that we can live out our faith with that we can share our story. So last week we talked about just sharing your story and what God has done for you. And as you do that, something can happen. That, that maybe you can share what God has done in your life and it'll impact someone else. God has helped you through addiction. He's helped you through brokenness, divorce. He's helped you through grief. What has God done? Without God, where would you be? And you begin to share that with the people in your oikos, in your household, and then you just trust God. You just trust God. You believe that God is the one who will open people's hearts. You just have to be obedient and faithful to what you think God is calling you to do. But let me just encourage you as Greg comes up. But let me just encourage you that this can happen through relationships. Through relationships. God will happen, uh, maybe use other situations, but for the most part, this will happen with the people that you're connected to. So would you do a little homework? I think this is important for us. Uh, not just to come on Sundays and uh, just hear me speak to you, uh, but to do a little work through the week, to ask God, would you help me to begin to map out my household, my community, who am I connected to? Begin to pray about that and ask him to begin to open the hearts of people and that he would use you. Would you stand as we pray and uh, sing this last song together? God, thanks so much for a good day and thank you for uh, allowing us to play a part in what you're wanting to do. 
Lord, I know you've put us in certain places on purpose and for reason. Would you help us to begin to see it's not just the place that we work out, it's not just the place that we work, uh, but our, our co-workers, our neighbors, uh, our opportunities for us to live out our faith um, with them. And the hope is that they'll begin to not only see something different, but will hear something as well. And God, we pray that you would open people's hearts. Help us to create the kind of place where we feel we can invite people to come and see who you are. That we wouldn't just be friendly, but we'd be welcoming and a wanting group of people. That we would help people see that this is a place they can belong. God, would you help us to do that? Lord, I'm praying for our friends who don't know you. I pray for them because you mean so much to us, God. The, the, the hope that is our anchor we really mean that, God. Would you help us to see we want other people to experience that? Would you give us a boldness and the courage to communicate that with others? I pray in Jesus' name.